Hi everyone, and welcome to another meetup with the Romania Power BI and Modern Excel user group. This is the third meetup of the month. This was an uh, extraordinary month with uh, three meetups. Usually we have two, a Romanian and an English uh, meetup. Thank you all for joining and thank you uh, for spending your time here learning with us when you could do anything else and be anywhere. Welcome to another session presented by, by one of the most renowned experts in Power BI community, Gustav Dudek. Thank you, Gustav, for accepting our invitation. I'm really glad to have you here and uh, finally meet you virtually for now. Let's see. Thank you, Thank you very much for the invitation. Great to be here. Hello, everyone. For our newest members, my name is Christian Angel, and together with uh, the second Christian, Christian Prifti, we will be your host today. Feel free to contact to connect with us uh, on LinkedIn. You have the short URLs on the bottom. There's not much difference there. Only the end. It's underscore p underscore a. We were just making fun about uh, how many Christies we have in uh, in our user group. Let's go quickly through uh, the agenda for today. We are on the welcome and overview uh, part right now. I'll shortly present you the next two meetups for April. Then Gustav will have uh, his uh, feature session. And not like this. I'm just clicking the wrong buttons here. Then we'll have a short Q&A in the end. Then the Enterprise DNA raffle, and I will tell you a bit more about it uh, in a few minutes. And then wrap up and uh, close the meetup, uh, the official recording, and uh, we can stay for chit chat afterwards. Some house rules for the uh, session today. Please make sure your microphone is muted and your video is turned off during the session. Well, I made sure of this. So uh, nobody, we, we won't have problem here. Please type your questions or comments in the chat. If you have a question, please prefix it with a Q so we can spot it easier. Uh, if you have problems with your internet connection, please drop off and join again. And uh, please be advised that this uh, meeting is recorded. And whoever doesn't want to uh, take part in a recorded session, now is the time to log off and uh, wait for the um, recording on our YouTube channel. Next meetups for April. On the 11th of April, we will have Jay Terhat from Microsoft. Uh, coming with a detailed session on visual calculations in Power BI. Uh, the new DAX that was released in uh, February, uh, doing a deep dive on visual calculations. And then on the 24th of April, we'll have the Romanian track session with Romulus Milia, a good friend of mine that uh, we know each other since 20 years. And uh, in the company where I work, there are still uh, files that were built that thing, that time by Romulus. So he's a really great expert talking about not the good practices in Excel like everybody does. He will be talking about back pra bad practices in Excel and how to avoid them. Uh, this meetup, the next ones, and most of our meetups are recorded and uh, uploaded on our YouTube channel. Uh, this is the short URL. Uh, Christy will paste the link in the chat. Uh, please subscribe if you cannot join in any of uh, our future sessions and uh, you will uh, see when the recording is uh, uploaded. I said earlier about a raffle. Well, every month we have a um, raffle uh, sponsored by our primary official sponsor, Enterprise DNA. We have a partnership with them since uh, 2021 and they are offering two full annual enterprise dna memberships for two members of the user group on every month in order to uh, allocate these uh, two memberships we, we will have a raffle in the end and in order to participate in the raffle please scan the qr code or go to the short link fill up the form and uh, we will uh, have the raffle in the end. Don't worry if you don't have the time to scan the QR code. Uh, I will paste it in the chat during the session. And uh, um, you'll have access to, to it. 
Even if you don't want to participate in the raffle, please fill up the form uh, for feedback so we can improve our future meetups with suggestions, with uh, um, opinions on uh, how we uh, are doing and so we can improve our next ones. Coming back to the session today. Uh, welcome again, Gustav, and thank you for uh, for being here. For who doesn't know Gustav, he's the head of uh, BI at the Polish company Enterium. Many years, many years of experience in the field of data analytics. Uh, uh, he's doing uh, all kind of uh, uh, data analytics um, um, processes inside the company. Uh, he's also an IBCS certified analyst uh, and uh, one of the enterprise DNA experts. Uh, exactly uh, part of our uh, sponsorship uh, partner here. Um, he regularly shares his uh, experience uh, um, in Power BI on LinkedIn, and uh, whoever doesn't follow him on LinkedIn, well, you should, because uh, you will learn uh, a lot, a lot from uh, Gustav. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to uh, learn from you, Gustav, few words about you and the stage is yours. So thank you very much for the introduction. I think you already said all the important details. What can I say more? Like you said, five years experience at Ethereum. I starting uh, being a data analyst, going through the senior data analyst, and now I'm in the, I have the role of the head of BI. I have a great team here, a lot of responsibilities as always. Um, also, sharing um, content on LinkedIn is also a big part of my, um, let's say, expertise in the field. So really glad to see all of you, no matter whether we are already known from the LinkedIn or we are not um, known each other yet. But it's really great to be here with you today and to have such opportunity to present to such a great audience. Thank you. Thanks. So let's dive into the presentation. I will screen. I make a screen sharing. Please let me know if everything is visible. Yeah, the PowerPoint is visible. Great. So today we are going um, to discuss the data visualization techniques, of course, only the selected ones, because as you perfectly know, excuse me for a second. Let's go to the beginning. So as you perfectly know, there are so many components of the Power BI report development, such as the conceptual work, data integration, transformations, data modeling, tags, and many other things um, around the Power BI. So of course we can't handle that all together today. So we are focused mainly on the front end. And of course, also, the front end is a very broad aspect, very broad topic. And today we only discuss like a very several topics which might be beneficial um, in your reporting systems, in your reporting development and general journey in data analytics. So basing uh, on our today's topic, which is a front end, of course, we will describe shortly the report structure, the chart selection according to the specific data fields, the selected functionalities in Power BI, whether it's native ones or basic on the custom visualization, because such topics we also will cover today, and some other things related with front end basing on interactive reports. So the idea here is just to talk through some examples relating with the front end. After that, after I will finish the presentation in PowerPoint, I would like to show you selected Power BI interactive reports and we can discuss that uh, further. And after that, I suppose we have the Q&A session and I will be happy to answer some of your uh, questions. So generally speaking, when it comes to the, the topics you would like to cover today, I would like to start with the distinction of the types of reports. Of course, there are, there are many different um, classification of the reports, but for our today purpose, we would like to distinguish the managerial executive reports and analytical dashboards because basing on that description, basing on that distinction, 
the chart selection, the KPIs we would like to present, the form, the structure of the ripple will be uh, substantially different. So starting with the know, starting with the know, the knowledge which kind of reports we would like to produce, then we establish which structure we have to place in our report. So let's say we have the managerial like executive reports, we have the analytical reports, and all of them are quite differently. And there are many different things, that many different objects that are different in both types of reports. So for example, of course, analytical reports are quite in-depth, uh, explanatory. They have the detailed analysis and con usually contain complex visualization. The simple one, of course, also, but there are more things like the map scatter charts and other things that are not necessarily available uh, in an um, uh, executive type of reports. There are plenty of interactive features, a lot of filtering capabilities, etc. And there are like le various levels of data ag aggregation. So there are data which are very, very granular. There are some kind of like the semi granular data and um, and also the overall. In comparison to the managerial dashboards, of course, they are more focused towards showing the trends, the performance, the benchmarks or objectives. They contain high level summaries, so not the very granular level of data, but the higher high level of uh, summaries. Uh, they have the in most cases, limited amount of interactions. They might, of course, include some interaction, but they might be more limited comparing to the analytical reports. Um, and of course, the data is more aggregated uh, comparing to the analytical reports. So it all means that whether you will create a managerial report or the analytical reports, the kind of the storytelling behind those type of reports might be uh, quite different. And of course, there are other dashboards like the showcased in quotation, so speaking, which of course can break a lot of rules and may include a lot of things which are um, outside the scope of either manager or analytical reports. They might have a lot of different decorative styles and elements which are not necessarily available in either manager or, or analytical report. So it's, I will distinguish that as a third type of dashboard. So just for purpose of our today presentation, as I said, there are many other types of distinction. So please let's take a look of that diagram that uh, we can see now. And this is like the very sample um, report layout. You can see like the headers, the section title, the filters, etc. And it will help us to discover what single elements can be incorporated into the report page. So we have the breakdown by page components. Of course, there might be other things. There might be either that some of them might be excluded, some of them might be added, of course. But let's focus on a, a very basic one. On a standard report page, we might have such element like different kind of text different kind of navigation, slicers, and other things like the icons and uh, images. In terms of the text, we might have the tiles and subtitles, no matter when we are talking about the page title and page subtitle, but also the titles and uh, subtitles respective to the given visualization. We, have, we might also have the username, which derives from the role level security. It's like optional, it depends on the on the report itself, we might have like additional information about the selection for our teams. So it's quite popular now to include such information for the end user of what has what selections has been done uh, throughout the analysis. It's not obligatory. In some cases, it might uh, improve the storytelling. Uh, we ha might have some text about the dates. What is the, the refresh date? What is the filter, the current um, filter selection when it comes to the days? And some kind of additional guidelines and um, tooltips, whether they are activated through additional pages, bookmarks, or tooltips as an additional small text box, either on the buttons or the um, visualization. In terms of when in terms of the navigation, we have the of course, main pages section, we might have additional views, the drill through pages, some kind of the buttons which gives you the ability to go to the previous page, the go to the blending page, clearing filters. These are like very commonly uh, known elements in terms of the navigation. In terms of the slicer, we can also distinguish some kind of types of slicers. It's like 
the exemplary it's it's my own um, approach to that thing the naming convention may be different but i usually work with uh, such types of the slicer as the date related so you can choose which date range should be available on the report page what the date, date granularity for example monthly quarterly yearly etc some kind of the functional slicer which gives you the ability to change the metrics for example from the revenues to costs or the whatever other metrics is it depends, of course, on the reports and on the on the title, the topic of the report itself and some kind of um, uh, slicer with the comparison selection. So whether we'd like to um, compare to the previous year, the budget or other, other benchmarks, etc. And of course, some categorical slicers, which gives you the ability to uh, filter the data according to some dimensions. So if you would like to um, exclude some information by filtering given products, clients, segments, department, etc. is the place for such slicers also, depending on the report type, of course. And some small things like an icons, images, which can include, like, for example, the company logo and buttons, icons, etc. And there are these are all things that in many cases are included on the report page. So we have to be very thoughtful about the report structure and how we would like to structure our navigation pane, our slicers, etc. So now I, I actually go back for a, just for a second. And if we just omit the, the page components for a second, we can see the sample report structure when we have the header pane, we have the title of the of the page, we have the additional information. Let's say it's last uh, data refresh, filter date. Uh, we have the navigation on the left and we have some kind of the uh, filter selection pane on the top of the report with some additional buttons. And it's of course only an exemplary report structure. When we go to the second slide, we can see a different report structure. Now we have the very strategic slicers on the left, some information is also on the, on the left. And uh, now the navigation components are in the right top corner. And the thing here is, I just show you two exemplary layouts but there is not like set in the stone structures, which is the best. I just showing you, I'm just showing you two of the most popular layouts that I usually uh, work with in my regular basis when I um, produce the reports. So whether we have the left pane or the upper pane with the navigation, both works well. And I will describe that uh, a bit even in, with more details after that. And here I just place two additional visualization because, of course, the visualization are like the most crucial part in each report. So I just include to our exemplary report structure two sample uh, information, two sample visualization in the form of the table and the form of the small multiples, just to show you, just to give you a, a scope of how it can look like if you place your real data into such report structure. And now we can see like the, the gray out report structure. And now we can see the report structure with already filled sections. And I would like to show that there are two approaches to that thing. So first approach is to create from A to Z the report layout in other um, graphics programs, for example, like the PowerPoint or Figma. So let's say we use the PowerPoint and we create a, from A to Z the, the template, the layout, and we can incorporate it into our Power BI as a background. However, there are some pros and cons. The pros is that we limit number of objects we have on the report page when going to the Power BI directly because we don't have the necessity to create additional objects in the form of shapes, um, backgrounds additional for visualization, etc. And it might look like this. So, for example, let's say in a PowerPoint, we establish some sections, for example, on the KPI cards, on the visualization, on the tabular views, whatever we would like to place on our report page. And that's the, the one approach. The approach that I usually take in my own reports is to like this, like the semi approach, like hybrid approach. So, I usually try to create um, some kind of a layout in the PowerPoint, but I try to leave most of the report section grayish in a, like in a, some kind of uh, gray colors. It gives me the flexibility in terms of manipulating the sections within the Power BI, because if I incorporate such kind of the report layout in the Power BI, I still have the huge 
and flexibility in terms of creating additional shapes in the forms of rectangles, etc., depending on what type of structure or what structures, what data I would like to present. So if I decide that KPIs will be longer or shorter, because sometimes we might have only two car KPI cards, sometimes five, sometimes two timeline charts, sometimes three more uh, greater amount of tabular views or less a number of tabular views. So it all depends, but using such approach, we also can quickly incorporate such sections as, as we actually need in the Power BI itself. And here is the example of how the report may look like. So for example, we have the layout uh, in, a, in a such form as I presented uh, before like here, and now we put some visualizations into the report page and it's actually resolved. So if you would like to, if we wanted to include such kind of element of visualization, the only need, the only need that we, the only thing that we need to, to place into our Power BI report was to create a white, in that case, a rectangle with a slight border without any kind of shadows. Shadows in some occasions are good. It might increase like the, the design from the design standpoint, uh, some appearance, but in most cases I try to exclude shadows and only include borders, uh, light borders. And that's how the, the report, how, how we look like. And here are the two different um, uh, samples. Here is the hotel revenue management, one of the challenges in uh, enterprise DNA contests. And we can see that the, and the navigation is in, on the left. Uh, in that particular case, the navigation was not extensively, um, it's not extended, there are no many views, so it's very short. We, we can incorporate it in a top left corner. We also have the um, drop down list for a um, uh, date range which gives you the ability to quickly uh, scan through the dates and change the, the information. We have the strategic filters and some additional functions like default, previous, home, etc. And it's all uh, wrapped up into the left side panel. So it's also possible, but it all depends on how many filters we would like to include and how many uh, detailed views we have on the report page. And from that point, we can structure our report. In the top, we have the KPI cards, which were relevant in that case. We have the timeline charts to see the trends and some categorical information on the right side. Other example is, for example, the second the, the second example is also from the contest on enterprise DNA. That one was created uh, in collaboration with Brian Julius, and it was written with Healthcore. And you can see that that particular um, report page, report structure is completely different to what we already discussed because it's so specific to that particular um, domain that we don't have actually any kind of the filter panes and we don't have the navigation pane also. We only have the one button which gives you the ability to activate it and to go to different um, information to different pages. So as you can see, there are a lot of different things, a lot of different approaches to the navigation, to the report structure, all should be, um, should meet requirements for the end users. In terms of the resolution of the canvas size, the default one is exactly as it's uh, described in the brackets but I usually, usually work with uh, extended resolution, which is 1080 to 1920. It's not also the set in the stone, it's not a rule that is always best, but in most cases in my own work, it just works worked better than the default um, page canvas. Of course, we also have to pay attention to the details such as the font size, because with the high resolution, we should have the higher also the, the higher font size, but knowing such small things, such small details and addressing them in an adequate way gives us a greater amount of space on the report page. So I usually recommend to increase that to, as described here, to 1080 to 1920. After that, in a second, we'll go to the, to the details regarding the, the specific fields or rules uh, when developing pay, um, report pages. 
And now I would like to also show the, the IBCS rules. We will be talking um, to some extent about the IBCS rules. And here are the authors, the founders, which is the Dr. Wolf Hihert and Dr. Jurgen Face who will uh, produce such kind of the IBCS guidelines. And one thing that I would like to point out here, which is quite crucial, is that it's quite difficult to incorporate IBCS style in the current state of the Power BI. So, of course, we might use the additional custom visualization, such as Zebra, InfoRiver, and other things, which are more suitable uh, to create IBCS, uh, certif IBCS um, uh, types of charts. However, in natives is still, in my personal opinion, quite difficult and we might have some workarounds, but it's not exactly the IBCS. It's like the charts, for example, I create are more like inspired by IBCS, but I can't say it's like IBCS because some of the rules are quite strict, are quite rigid to some extent. and if we don't maintain the structure and the visual appearance of that IBCS charts, it's not IBCS anymore. It's like the replica to some extent. So it's very, mm, quite, very quite relevant distinction in that case. And now what I would like to show you is the very basic guideline. Of course, there, there are tons of rules, but I only selected the few of one, the, the few that I would like to describe with you to to guide you and to walk through. So in that case, let's focus, for example, on the chart selection. And as we will be talking in a few seconds about the trends, not the benchmarks, not the comparison, but the trends. So let's stay focused on those mm, particular charts, not that one, but those groups. So we can see that we have the data points, pattern, structural composition. You, you might see that for time series, mm, actually the most uh, beneficial are um, specific type of charts with the x axis um, with the x axis showing the timelines and in terms of showing the structures so for, for example revenues by product revenues by client etc the structural data will be uh, greatly um, visualized using for example um, the horizontal the vertical structure excuse me for example in the form of the data bars etc in terms of the time series, what will be uh, very beneficial is, of course, the column charts, the line charts, the area charts might be also a good choice, not always, but might be. And the part of the holes, like the summary, is summary is summarized to 100%, either it's the area or it's the, mm, it's the column chart, stacked column chart, I missed that, I apologize. Uh, some kind of the reference, additional lines, for example, combo charts, and the waterfalls. These are all good choices in terms of showing uh, timelines, the trends across the, the periods. And here are just the selected rules uh, from the IBCS that might be like a good starting point to create visualization in the Power BI. And there are some things that we can still achieve using the native ones, for example. We'll be also talking to some extent about custom visualization, but but uh, we will also talk about the natives. So first of all, uh, which is quite important from my perspective, is that if we would like to display the data uh, per period, per data, per date, sorry, so we should, in that case, uh, should, we should use the uh, such kind of frame. So for example, the columns, the line charts, when the, on X axis, we see the, uh, the time, the periods. And on the other hand, if you'd like to present the categorical data, such as the countries, like in that case, we would like to use a such kind of perspective. Then what, ki what can be also beneficial, of course, it depends on the report itself, but to, it's also very vital to add data points. So we create a more compelling, more insightful story. If we, of course, if applicable, we add uh, more data points to our charts. Comparing to showing only the, the scope. Of course, sometimes it's very important also to filter down the data to specific timeframes, but in some cases showing the long-term trends, it's usually better to see the longer periods comparing to the shorter periods. Sometimes it might be also good to show the overlay charts, like the compo charts, in speaking the native, uh, in terms of the native visualization combo charts. Sometimes we would like to split those charts to the the um, separate one 
but in many cases it's also good to use the, the overlay charts. Of course, it's also important to whatever we can to use the unified scale. So here is an example of ununified scale we, when we see the sales in MUSD and also profit in million USD, which are quite similar, which actually have the same units because it's all in MUSD. However, they are not scaled. So there is the, it's like the misleading information about what is the profit comparing to sales. And here is the unified scale, so we can see that the sales is a scale, the profit is scaled with sales and vice versa. And it's recommended in terms of the IBCS standards. Uh, other things like the replacing spaghetti charts is also uh, recently common. So replacing the charts with have many lines in a single chart and break it down to the small multiples and some things like avoiding the unnecessary clutter when it comes to the labels. Here example with the, the cluttered labels and here is this example of the uncluttered labels. Of course, not always is very easy in native visualization to create such kind of report comparing to some kind of custom visualization, but, but we will be uh, discussing that later on. And here is the, just an exemplary report when we show trends. In that case, we will focus in our report on the financial liquidity. So we are showing the uh, so-called cash in hand and remaining credit funds. And I will be showing also the second part in a second uh, later. on. So let's focus on the uh, left side. We have the three major KPI cards, but what is the most important here as we're talking about the trends is how we can incorporate native visualizations such as stacked column charts or line charts to express the uh, the trends. Of course, there is also the slicer, which gives you the ability to show a respective amount of months. In that case, it's the 12 month, but we can extend it to, let's say, 20 if it, if it should be relevant. So in terms of this, mm, both those uh, charts, there are to some extent um, complementary. So now we can see how it how it builds upon the specific uh, time. How how was the uh, what was the results on a specific uh, time period? But is it stacked? So in that in that case, it highlight a bit in a bit uh, better way the totals because we have seen the the one metric, the second metric above, and the totals. So it's a very good thing that we have the ability to show also the totals in a stacked in column charts. However, what might be more difficult to achieve in terms of the visualization standpoint is to compare actually how, what is the trend on a, either what first metric or the second metric because the specific metric is above the other. So it's as it's not it's not now starting from the baseline from the zero, it, it might be a bit um, harder to to spot the trends. So in that case, we have the additional um, line charts, which gives you the ability to spot the trends on the one metric and the second metric at the same time. So I would consider those charts as a complementary. Here we have the focus on totals, how it was, uh, how it were built towards specific time periods. And now we have the, the trend using the trend line. And here are actually the similar information, but in a more detailed way, because now we have to see the cash at hand uh, like in a consolidated way, and now we have the breakdown by the company. And we use the ARIA uh, stack chart. So the grayish one is the totals. So we have the specific um, totals, the summarized volume for the company one, two, three, and four, and is the great part, the gray part. And uh, we also have the uh, dark uh, blue color for the area for the respective company. So that area is for company one, that for company two, three and four. So it gives us not only the information at, about the scale between the companies, but also to the totals. And uh, the fourth uh, chart is the so-called, let's say the spaghetti chart, but in that case, we only have the four lines, so it's not so cluttered, but some kind of additional features was uh, were used because now we are highlighting only the specific line. So in that case, in that case, we use the slicer to highlight the company too. And you can see that only that particular line is highlighted and the other one are gray out. If we have enough time, I will dive deeper into that particular report page after the PowerPoint presentation. 
here is like the embedded report page, but I will skip that for a second and I will go to the uh, further analysis. And here is another example of the trend analysis. We have the financial ratios on um, uh, actually the four uh, different financial ratios on the line charts. But what is important here is, as we can see, now the unified, uh, the y-axis scale is ununified. So let's take a moment and uh, see what are the values. So for example, for receivable turnover, we have uh, we have the 33 days in that particular period. But when you go to the payable turnover ratio, we can see that 33 is in also in a uh, last period, but 33 here value is much higher than here. And it's because all the charts are unscaled. So are scaled to their in, they are independent and they are scaled to their own y-axis. So it might be good sometimes to to enhance spotting the the fluctuations when other ways might be quite flat if it would be uh, synchronized. But in that particular case, in some cases we would like to also see the those KPI uh, those uh, indicators in a in a scaled manner. So we will dive into that more in a second. From different things regarding to that particular visualization, we can see that we have plenty of different options like adding the target line. Of course, it's the native option. Highlighted data points, it's also available. It's not like the built-in uh, feature on a click, but using the DEX-based approach, we can also highlight specific data points. We might use additional KPI cards just to uh, increase the information and increase the data storytelling. And when it comes to um, y-axis unification, you can see the, the previous view where the y-axis scale was non-unified and here is the unified. So now it's a bit flattened, but it's more appropriate to compare different KPIs across others. So it gives us a bit better scope about the uh, relation between one indicator and the other. And here is a different uh, example of having non-unified scale. So now we have the business line, we have the revenues and the gross profit. So from one hand, we might want to compare the gross profit to the revenues across uh, in, inside one specific business line. We have the revenues, gross profit. We'd like to see the scale between them, but we would like to compare the business line to other business lines. So we can make the comparisons either vertically or horizontally. But now you can see that each of six charts are independent because it's the, it's the first chart, second, third, fourth, etc. And there are all different scales and all information or charts actually look the same. But if we would have the unified y-axis scale, we can see how it look in the reality. And here is the comparative version that I will that I showed you previously. So this is actual the numbers of that respective exemplary business line. So we can see like the what was the gross profit according to the revenues in a business line one, but we can also spot that the business line has substantially greater revenues and gross profit comparing, for example, to the business line three, which has a um, low, lower number lower numbers in terms of the value of revenues and gross profit. And here is one more um, example of non-unified and unified um, charts. Here we have the three financial ratios and in, in ununified form and here in unified form in terms of y-axis scale. And we also can see that what was the scale, what was the relation between, for example, the trade payables comparing to the cash at hand, etc. And it enhanced our uh, abilities to compare those three metrics. And here is the same thing with metrics um, and also other metrics in the form of the line charts. And when it comes to y-axis unification, there are a few actually options to, to make it happen, to achieve that result. And let's focus, for example, on the first um, measure, on the first approach. First approach is the DAX base. Of course, in some cases, when you have a very low very large databases, it might influence, impact our capacity, our performance. But in many cases, we also can include those DAX based y axis unification without many loss in terms of the performance. So it's like the matter of testing. But 
in many cases, depending on the, the database, we might want to use the y-axis unification using the DAX. So the logic behind that is quite simple. We would like to retrieve the max value and the uh, minimum value, depending on the on the KPIs, on the indicators, and use them as an FX, like a conditional formatting on y-axis scale. So for example, if we would like to see what was the number for the max uh, value across, for example, three different K, three different charts because we have the three different charts with three different uh, KPIs. We can use the max and the values in terms of the monthly granularity. So we are searching the greatest, the max max value uh, for one indicator, from one measure, for the second measure, for the third measure. Then we create the um, so-called table in that case, and we retrieve the result using once again the max. We're using the volume in a bracket and um, multiplying that number, for example, by 1.1, 1.2 is optional and it gives us a bit more like um, space between the higher number, higher value of the column, for example, on the charts and the ceiling. And in some cases, it increases the visibility of the data labels, etc. So here we retrieve the maximum value respective to that three uh, metrics. And if we apply that particular uh, measure to our mm, three charts separately, we will, we, will be, we will achieve the scalable synchronized y-axis scale. And the same with um, y-axis minimum value, because in some cases they might uh, start with the bottom line, with the zero, and if it's always the zero, we can just fix that number in, in putting the zero in a y-axis minimum value, but if the mean might be lower than the zero, then the y-axis mean value also has to be DAX-based, and we would like to also incorporate the zero, because in some cases uh, the minimum value for those three metrics might be higher than zero, but we would like to start our charts from the zero. So it's important distinction between max and minimum, that in many cases in terms of the searching the minimum value, we would like to also include the, the zero. And the result is, as you can see here, but here also we can see the, the secondary approach to unification scale and we can use the small multiples. But the thing with small multiples is that we might not have the specific data structure to achieve such kind of information because we just have the three different metrics. We have the cash at hand, trade receivables, trade payables, three different indicators, three separate, separate measures but we can easily create disconnected additional tables with three metrics and create one metric switch um, measure. And in that case, we can put the additional uh, column metric with, from our disconnected table to our small multiples, and we can use the uh, metric switch as, an, as our value, and all figures will be populated according to the to the category and in that case we can achieve unification of y-axis scale for different metrics using one additional disconnected table one additional switch that is switch based metric and we can achieve that result using the small multiples there are of course a lot of small uh, a lot, lot of pros and cons but we could discuss about the topic one hour or even more uh, going further, when it comes to the label density, the fastest way to achieve um, a lower label density is to use the so-called continuous axis scale. Because if we use our date, our dates, which are not categorical, so which is not, for example, the um, Q3 slash year, but the, there are continuous, we can use the type from, we can change the type from categorical to continuous, and that way we can enable the label density um, slider. And in that case, by manipulating the label density, we can see, for example, for 25% approximately, we might have the uh, first value, the minimum value, the highest value, the latest value, the, the maximum value, and the the maximum, the maximum in terms of the date range, I mean, and the maximum value in terms of the value itself. So it's the fastest way. However, when it comes to um, the categorical data, so for example, as the um, short months on the X axis, it's not possible to create label density slider because now we have the categorical X axis type. So in that case, we have to again have the DAX based calculations. And for example, we might 
uh, check you might search for the minimum date for a maximum date let's say for a, um, for a value for the minimum for the maximum value across all those periods we are searching for start of month because the chart present the a month of granularity, so we are searching for the minimum and maximum value across all those data in a monthly granularity. And using the results, we might check whether the selected value for the respective date range equals to mean or max date, or if the values of, for example, 13,000 uh, equals to the minimum views, which derives from uh, those two metrics. And if it's true, then return the metric. If not, return blank. There are a lot of different options to achieve different quality for our labels, at least four. But it's just an example how we can create such a look, which is um, quite adequate to the continuous uh, label. As you might see, I actually used here also the continuous, but uh, it would also work with the categorical and it would give us a, some, in some cases, all additional. Uh, features like showing only the last data points or including only the data points for the maximum or minimum values. So we can create such a tax based approach to highlight specific data points on our charts and we might mm, get such results as here. So here the minimum, the maximum and the last data points has been highlighted in terms of the data labels. When it comes to the trends, it's also very vital in terms, of course, depending on the on the report structure and the analysis is also vital to include so-called moving averages. So we can see that we have a lot of fluctuations here and here as the grain lines, the same here in terms of the revenues across different uh, years, different months. But the moving average gives us uh, this, this call about the trend. Is it trending upward, down, etc. And the moving average usually can be also determined dynamically, for example, by different slicer slicer selection. And here is actually the example of how the moving average can smoothen the fluctuations ranging from the the one month to the 12th month. And this is sample DAX approach. There are a few, at least a few approaches to the um, to the moving averages. I know that there is also the um, no calculate approach. Um, for example, highlighted by the Greg Deckler or different things with the Windows function, for example, it's just an example of using the smoothing average, moving average lines. And here are different examples of how we can incorporate some style uh, to our line charts, for example, to highlight specific points or to highlight specific lines. And I'm not saying that it's ob like obligatory. In many cases, we don't need those kind of functionalities, but in some cases it might increase our storytelling capabilities and it increase how the data is um, um, interpreted in, in a what way by the end user. So it's in very, in most cases it might be beneficial, but we only use that in a very specific ones. And now we go to the benchmark comparison. So we discussed to some extent the trend lines. Now we are going to the benchmarks and I would like to focus on some kind of the charts now that are suitable for showing the trends. Uh, sorry, not trends, benchmarks. So in that case, we also see the column charts, overlapping column charts. Uh, we have the uh, line charts, the, the bar charts. We also have the variance charts, areas. Uh, for real, for relative, for absolute, because in IBCS the relatives are um, displayed in a different way comparing to the absolute variances. And we have also the waterfalls that might be also very uh, relevant in terms of visualization, visual, uh, visualization of the benchmarks. And now we also have the few samples of the IBCS rules, of course, the selected ones. And I intentionally keep this the one uh, rule the same, which was for so also for the trends. And it gives us the information that no matter we would like to show only the actuals, show only the trends, or we would like to show the benchmarks, it's still vital to use the, uh, the specific um, 
perspective, whether it's vertical and horizontal, depending on whether we're displaying the structural data as here or the timelines periodic data as here. And in terms of visual, uh, visualization of the benchmarks, there are some uh, kind of the guidelines. So first of all, replace gauges and speedometers. These are in most cases great or it might be great when the data is live. So when we get the information on every second, for example, the gauges or speedometers might be all might be a valid options. But in terms of, for example, the financial data or the operational data, which is uh, which uh, which is refreshed every single day or every single month, quarter, etc., it's usually better to stick with the um, specific major charts comparing to the either gouges or speedometers. Look, the second, replace traffic lights. So the traffic lights might be still a step forward comparing to showing only the, the values, only the, the values in terms of the, like the text. But uh, the best way is to use the data bars. And the major advantage of data bars is that we can quickly see the scale between the variances. Because, for example, only the red sign or green sign, of course, it still might be enough, but it only gives you the 0, 1 information, like so called 0, 1. Because 4 means that something is, for example, below, green might be above, let's say, but we don't see how much above or how much below. And when we visualize those data on the data bars, we not only see in the form of the color using, for example, red, green, it, it not necessarily have to be red or green. There are other palettes which are also suitable in terms of the accessibility standpoint, etc. But let, let's say that the, four, the, the red is negative and let's say the green is positive. So we not only see what, what was the positive variance and negative, but we can compare them and see and spot what comparison was the marginal and might be not so important for the business and what variances are greater and might be the main drivers and should get the most our attention to make some actions. In terms of uh, variances, it's also generally good to add variances because we can only mm, use display actuals comparing to the budget, for example, to the previous year, etc., and skip the variances. But in many cases, it's just good to not only see the performance of the actuals and the comparisons, but also the variance in many ways. It's also good to embed charts elements in tables. It's not so it's not so extended comparing to some kind of a custom visualization, but also in native ones, we can incorporate the data boards. In some cases, they are not adequate to some extent. I can explain that uh, further, explain that in detail uh, in later on. But generally speaking, we can use a lot of different formatting options in tables that gives us the information about the variances. We cannot use the waterfall charts within the tables, for example, but we can still use uh, the data bars. And we can show multitude charts, which is also mm, recommended as here, when we have the actuals, for example, on the bottom and multi and uh, variances either absolute or relative in a percentage above. And I will show you um, a few examples later on because it's not so easy in, in natives ones, but it's general guidelines for us. It's just good to know that it's beneficial just to add variances in such way comparing to showing only, for example, the performance as an actual comparing to one scenario in general. And here is the example of how the data can be can look like when we only see the actuals. So here we have only the, the one metric, the actuals. In that case, it's uh, the, these are revenues and we only see the data bars. But we can see how many different things, how many different insights we can get only using the embedded um, variances. So now we can not only see the actuals and what was the scale between, for example, different business units as here is a like, exemplary web app, e-commerce, mobile, mobile app. We can see how what was the scale between them, but we can also see what which business line have the either maybe marginal 
a level of the variance or maybe the greater. And we, of course, can include on, on um, the subtotals, maybe exclude on subtotals. That particular one was made uh, with the Zebra PI. So, of course, there are a lot of different options that are currently not available in uh, natives, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, but I think and I believe that in the future there will be more uh, different uh, customized options also in the natives. Other thing that we can incorporate to um, extend our variances, our structure, is just to add additional categories, either in a form of the rows, so we can add additional information. So Below the business line, we now have the, for example, product, so we get the more information and we can incorporate additional columns, for example, uh, by using uh, different scenarios. Now it's like comparing to the plan, to the budget, but it can be also incorporated as a previous year and other benchmarks. So in that case, we can simply add context to our data to give more insightful information. Of course, in some cases we only see, we would like only to see one single KPI card, but in many cases we also would like to see the extended information to get that suitable insights. And here is just an example, uh, still based on a Zebra BI. If we can take it even step farther and add additional visualization and timelines as here, and additional structures, so for example, breakdown by projects, for example, breakdown by um, a customer, we can see that we can um, extend our single value in the form of the actuals with the variances, with the timelines, with the structures, and it gives us the better understanding of the of the business in that case. Of course, it's not so simple in the natives one, but I will cover native later on. In terms of the native tables, it's like the very exemplary case of what we can incorporate to our tables. So let's say we have still the, the values for our budget, we have the actuals, we have the, the data bars exclusively for our data for our actuals, and we can add some kind of the variance indicators as here. And here's another additional uh, functionality in the form of the conditionally formatted colors for either positive or negative variances with um, icons. Here is more simplistic approach when we only see the variances, but all are in the fixed color without any kind of indicators and colors. And the last one, and that one is the most recommended by me personally, comparing to the other two, is by incorporating the data bars. And uh, unfortunately, data bars for the absolute and the variances uh, for the relative will be uh, looking the same in the form of the, the bars, not pins, lollipops, charts, etc. But it gives us the scale. So in many cases, of course, if the analysis of the variances is uh, relevant, because if not, maybe only the actuals are important. But uh, if you would like also to include the variances, then the data bars can be highly recommended. And here is only the uh, example example of um, the tabular views using the natives one when we incorporate the data bars. Just a quick question: How much time we have left to wrap up the this specific time uh, part of our discussions? Uh, Fifteen minutes uh, for now, officially, but unofficially we can stay longer because uh, whoever uh, had a, a me meeting already had to leave and uh, they will uh, see the recording. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, one question, uh, mm -hmm. will you sure. share any files afterwards so we can upload them with the recording? Yeah, I will share the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And here, uh, continuing the presentation, here is just a, a very quick, um, example of how we can introduce the quite um, new feature, which is the dynamic formats. There are a lot of different dynamic formatting options now because we can incorporate it in the form of the, the labels in a visualization pane, but we can also use the format dynamic pane. And the one example here is that to show you that we can incorporate different styles, different units in a different in a one individual table. So we can see that we have, for example, the values as a uh, in a thousand of 
let's say dollars, but we also incorporated the percentages and it's available through different approaches. But the, that particular one is achieved by the determining what was the unit for given uh, rope. In that case, for each non percentage record should be the value. And in that case, it's like the format here. And if it's the uh, unit so called um, equals to two, because the, the template for and the structure for the table is designed in such way that each row has the a very unique um, ID for the unit. So for example, the direct margin gets the ID number two. So if we apply the dynamic format, so if it knows that it's on a level of the direct margin, which has the ID number two, then it ex uh, display the percentage value. And for, for example, the blank rows, it displays the free semicolons, which gives you the, the blank. It's optional and it's not important from that um, conversation, but it's good to know that we have the different options to incorporate different uh, units in a, diff in a single table. And here is the sample of uh, sample table. Then we incorporated um, different metrics like the previous year uh, and the comparison to the, the previous year budget, etc. And I will skip just for a second the, the presentation because I would like to show you one thing here, which is quite relevant. I will switch it to the presentation here. And uh, and it's quite relevant technique that might be important. So let's say we have the, the report page when we would like to compare our information to the previous year or to budget as a single select, whether to one or another. And here we have some kind of different charts. We have the, the column charts, timelines, and we have the tabular view. Each should express either the comparison to the previous year or the budget using only a single slicer. And here is the basic approach how we can handle that. Because as you can see, if you if you click the previous year, you can see the previous year and the, either in the values and the variances are displayed in a table. And accordingly, if you click the, the budget, the plan, you can see the values are now changed to the budget. And we can incorporate that. It, here is the, the quick snapshot of whether we use we can use the switch or the field parameter, but the basic idea is to use the field parameter to achieve a such state and such functionality. And what can be achieved, what, what can be done to achieve such results is to create such so-called like the master tables. So in that case, the table scenario contains the old scenarios we would like to have on a, on our one uh, slicer selection. So we have the slicer here, previous year budget. Here we have the table previous budget, one, two, as our IDs. And this is our main table. This table will be used to create this kind of uh, slicer, which will control all the information, all the charts across the single page and we have respective scenarios. All of them are necessary to express different data, different variances in our report page. In, they are connected by one to one using the scenario ID. So we use the scenario ID from our table and we incorporate scenario ID to our each uh, single parameter. I know there is a lot of information here, but the presentation will be uh, offered and uh, shared so you can dive that more looking at the at the specific approaches. But the main uh, thing, the main steps that we should take here is to add then ID in a last so called tuple uh, in a last uh, part in our field parameters. So originally by default, we only see the, for example, zero one as an order of our field parameter values, but we can add additional ones either in a form of a description of a text in a brackets or we can use IDs in a form of the values. So if we add the respective IDs at the end of our each field parameter, then we can effectively uh, link our field parameters to our main table. And each our field parameters will be controlled by this one main table. And here is additional information how we can incorporate a dynamic subtitle, but it's not so important. 
uh, for our presentation. So it was like the quick snapshot of how we can incorporate dynamic comparison, dynamic benchmark um, comparison. And here are some mm, attempts to use the natives one to create so-called inspired IBCS inspired charts and it's like multi-tier but the main thing I would like to point out here is that I don't recommend to use such kind of for example the lollipop charts because I know it's it's achievable we can do that but it's also the kind quite time consuming so personally after using all of that kind of charts I would rather stick with using the columns either for the absolute variance and relative variance and I would like to show you a few um, alternatives of how we can incorporate native visualization to enhance our data storytelling. So that one is just an overlapped columns. It's not that it's not good because previously we said that it's good to use also variances, but also using the overlapped columns is still a good step forward in showing the data. So in that case, we have the model scenario, the comparative scenario. Let's say the model is our budget and we compared it to other scenarios. And we have the two columns that are overlapped. We have the values and we can see how we can, uh, what was the variance to the budget. And in that case, we have only like 42 um, a variance, which is quite marginal because our total is 2.2 and our budget is 2.2. So it's not so mm, relevant. It's only 1.5%. But it's only the one uh, example of how, of how we can in, introduce the newly added overlapped columns. So it's quite good upgrade from the Power BI core visual team to use such kind of to, to enable us as a Power BI developers, report developers to use such kind of uh, columns and bars as well. And here are different uh, examples of how we can incorporate performance, the actuals versus, for example, the budget and variances and uh, that one is so-called like it's an imitation of the multi-tier but either taking into consideration that we can implement such so-called multi-tier charts even using only the single chart because now we can add for example the line we can add a lot of different uh, error bars etc and we can see a lot of different examples uh, on linkedin where a lot of very brilliant people can create uh, multi-tier using only the single chart. In my case, using uh, showing you that particular example, I try to incorporate two separate charts. I know that from theory, it's it's not the best choice. It's not the best choice because, for example, we can't implement it as a small multiples. But I, in most cases, either way, I really like to use such kind of different charts. There are some things with the there might be some marginal discrepancies in terms of the width of our charts, but we can hide the X axis and Y axis using the transparent color and we can place one above each other. And it's quite simple to create. It's quite uh, time efficient and the result might be really just enough to drive specific insights. So I would not avoid uh, using the two separate char charts. In many cases, it still might be a good choice. And here is a different uh, different uh, elements with KPI cards, but I would go uh, forward because of the time constraints. And there's the different uh, approaches to showing the overlapped columns with additional KPI cards on the top with uh, with title subtitles, of course, with legend at that uh, particular case on the bottom. And here we go also to the KPI cards. And then native KPR cards, generally speaking, gets a lot of um, new functionalities recently using the so-called reference labels. So we can not only display the values, but we can also name the, uh, the benchmarks, give them the values and give them the respective uh, variances, colors, etc. So it's a really nice upgrade. It's a bit time consuming, to be honest, to create all of the reference labels, especially if we have a lot of metrics, but it's still, in my personal opinion, much better way comparing to using the native card the old one because we have the text boxes we have the old cards but generally speaking in man, in 99 percent of cases i would say the new native cards are the better options and even if it might be time consuming it's the best current option to use the indicators 
and the different uh, different samples. It all looks quite similar, but you can see on a pre previous page that it's actually a different layout. It's a different layout. But now we can see that we have the um, variances a bit higher. So normally you would see the values and probably on the bottom we would see the variances, but now the variances are higher comparing to the title. I don't know, it's, I like the nuances. I will try to describe it more, but I'm afraid it's it's not so much time to, to discuss all of the things, but it's only a sample of how the KPI card may look like using the reference labels in a specific configuration. And one thing, and a big shout out to Daniel Marsh Patrick, who also uh, tried to use the SVG based implementation using the bullet, using the, the SVG to create the so called bullet chart, which is normalized, is recommended by APCS. And for example, Daniel tried to incorporate it using the SVG, which is not achievable using the native uh, SVG. Is like semi native feature because it's applied to the native tab tables, but it requires different coding methods. But the big shout out to Daniel Marsh Patrick and big shout out also to Andrzej Leszkiewicz, who creates a lot of different wonderful and very amazing and effective visualization IBCS inspired, which are quite similar and it's all based in SVG. So big kudos. And uh, actually, the, the last thing in terms of the presentation I'd like to show you is that we commonly would like to uh, display the dynamic date range as an inf either, as, either as an information, for example, in the corner of the report, what was the date selection or in uh, subtitles for our charts. And I would like to show you like two not so common um, approaches to showing the date ranges. And let's see on the first one. So with the one DAX uh, sample in formula, but the main idea behind the formula is to give you a flexibility in terms of how the data is displayed. So it's not obligatory, of course. We don't always have to complicate that, that um, element so much, but if you'd like to enhance to some extent the storytelling and the appearance of the report, in some cases it might be just good and the DAX formulas are quite easy to copy and paste and to replicate in other reports. So it's not so much effort when it's copy once. So let's say we have the year 2023 is a single selection and we don't see that here because it's the drop down. But let's say we um, stopped on November 23 and not we not have we don't have selected uh, December 23. So now the this, the date range is from January 23 to November 23. But if we pick the year month all, which means that all year is uh, fully selected. Now we don't see the uh, Jan 23 to that 23, which also be completely fine if that would work that way. But the formula works that way. That's now just the 2023. And we would, if we would like, for example, to incorporate additional year, it's not anymore the single select. It's now the multi selection, and we have the 2022 to 2023 because we have the selected tw two different years, and we have the respective date range. And the different approach, which is different, which is based on a different measure, gives you an one additional piece of information. So let's say comparing to the previous uh, examples that we have non contiguous periods selected. So now we have a uh, Now we have year uh, multi select and we have year month multi select, but one information is not selected. One period is not selected. So Normally, in a, for, in a previous um, formula, we have Jan 80 to December 24, but we don't have the November 24 actually selected. So the formula works in such way that we have the information multiple periods. So it's like the tweaks, like the adjustments, in which in such case, in specific cases, can be beneficial. And just to wrap up the presentation, because I will not uh, switch back to the presentation, I would like to take the opportunity to get uh, to give a big credits to a specific uh, people. There are a tons, a lot of people who are not listed here, but it's very important from my perspective to give them a big uh, shout out and credits in terms of different uh, like aspects, in terms of Power BI in general. Here we have the Brian Julius, Injupar, Read Heavens. A knowledge bank is a YouTube channel. I don't have like the LinkedIn name of the founder, but it's also very valuable. Kurt Beller 
sorry if I don't didn't uh, pronounce it correctly in advance. In terms of the data visualization, Miguel Myers, Alexander Bardieu, Carlos Barbosa, Claudio uh, Trombini, Gerard, Sean Chindler, Nick Debra, said Jamal, probably he's even uh, with us, so big uh, best regards to him. Uh, from the DENEP standpoint uh, and SVG and some customization, Daniel Marsh, Patrick, Greg Phillips, Angel Shkevich, Madison, uh, Ben Ferry, in terms of the DAX, of course, SQLBI, Brian Julius, again, Greg Deckler, Chandeep, Antrix from the Enterprise DNA, Rick DeGroot and Power Query, Melissa, Chandeep, Rick again. So best regards also to them because we won't be so knowledgeable if they didn't uh, put so much effort on LinkedIn and YouTube to share their knowledge. So be curious. Very true. Very true. And this is why we are here. And this is why I love this community because we can all learn from each other. Exactly. So in terms of the presentation and PowerPoint presentation, it's all I have a lot of um, examples in interactive version. I would like to walk through some of the um, sample Power BI reports. If we have enough time, we I can just show you the one. If not, yeah, we can just please. go. Please, only one because we also have some questions and uh, I would keep two minutes for the raffle. Oh, okay. So we can no wrap problem. up in uh, 30 minutes completely with everything. We already have 10 questions uh, in the line. So maybe that one because it's the like the most extended one and it's like quite of storytelling behind that particular report. So we have the navigation in the uh, top level here and we have a bunch of different uh, analysis. We start with the executive summary. We have the P&L budget, revenues, expenses, HR, business line process. It's very extended uh, demo. So let's say we have the budget, for example, and some information that we can mm, derive from that particular views, it's like the managerial PNL with the supplemental table. And there are some great storytelling things that we can obtain using the Power API. So let's say we have the web app development business line, we have the revenues. If we click, we would like to get a more detailed information about that particular um, business line. So we can see that we have now the breakdown by projects and we can analyze the performance against the budget in the form of also in the form of the uh, variances, absolute, relative, etc. Maybe some specific kind of um, costs are the most interesting to us at that particular moment. You can click that and see that on a tabular uh, view. What's more, let's say we would like to dive more into the specific either um, business line or the project. Let's say the business line. We can click that and we can have implemented the drop down list with respective um, names of the pages that where we would like to go uh, in a drill through mode. So it's like the dynamic drill through mode, that, which is based on a, a slicer selection. We have the specific names. And now when we click on a single category, let's say the business line, business line web app, we can see we have the C details now active in terms of the uh, drill through button. So if we click the C details, we can go directly to the revenue page and we can see that the, all the information now only uh, display the, that single particular web app development. And now we can uh, continue our analysis using that particular page because we have the breakdown in, in an aggregated way as a, time, uh, as a timeline in a form of the heat map. We can change, for example, to the customer one or in other uh, elements. So we can deepen our analysis. We can even go to the, for example, small multiples in that case are available or go, for example, to the details with respective uh, accounting positions. Let's say we go to the, the budget once again. We can do the same thing, for example, with the expenses. Let's say we have the B2B contracts in terms of the personal costs within the direct expenses, we can change to HR. And now we go to the HR and we can analyze our HR information on a different page. There are different views. Let's go to the charts for a second. So we have like the contract types B2B because it's uh, the drill through mode. We have the departments. We can change that, for example, to the project, the, to the role. Let's go to the role for a second. 
by position, developers, senior developers, etc., departments, we can see that on a on a trend lines, for example, what was the average headcount or average CTC, depending on which uh, metric we would like to analyze, we can go to the heat map and see what was the, for example, CTC by specific uh, person. So we can uh, dive into the more detailed information using the the drill for mode, which is from the storytelling perspective, highly beneficial in many cases. We have other things like the analysis of the business line. So we have the aggregated data. We can see what was the revenues, direct costs. We can see on the timeline. We can see the uh, specific information. We can go to the project and see which products uh, were the most uh, profitable, which are the, uh, high, the highest, the, the higher margin, which are below and etc. We can, of course, uh, analyze that in a perspective uh, on, on the timelines. We can change the granularities. So let's say we'd like to analyze data in a quarter way. So now it's the quarterly. We can change to the monthly. We can analyze the um, inflows, outflows, balance sheet information. So all in one place using different things. And it's actually the dark deep. It's uh, completely not related to IBCS. None of that is related to the IBCS. However, in many cases, uh, if the data is presented in a way which is under understandable for the end user, it's still very insightful and um, it's it works in such way that no matter it's a light dim or dark dim or which kind of charts we use, if we use that in a respect to the specific KPR and requirements for our end users, it might be highly beneficial and effective report. We would, could talk a lot more about either that particular report or other ones that I prepared, but I think we should probably go with the Q&A session. Yes, yes, it's it's great. And I think we could spend hours only on this report, uh, uh, considering how, how big it is and exactly. how well it's prepared. Uh, let me share my screen again and uh, go through some of the questions. Uh, Okay, let's see the first one. First one was from uh, Mohammad. Can you please explain about what font and title size should we choose for uh, 1980 by 1080, 1080 by 1980? Generally speaking, any, aside, mm -hmm. any recommendation? As I remember correctly, generally speaking, I try to use between 11 to 13 pixels for title subtitles. So let's say 13 pixels and a little bit down, for example, 12 for subtitles, generally speaking. Of course, when it uh, comes to the, um, for example, page title, page subtitle, it will be even higher. But in terms of the titles and subtitles for our charts, it will be approximate to 13. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another one. Uh, what courses, articles, YouTube channels uh, do you recommend? Uh, you already did at the end. So this was uh, towards the beginning of the presentation. So you already had the list uh, from Nikos. As much as I love those visuals looking so clean and professional, I can't help but be overwhelmed by the amount of measures and extra visuals needed to achieve the result. And uh, you already mentioned that, that uh, on some of them, with the reference labels and everything, yes, it can be tedious, but uh, it's the only way, right? Yeah, and I think there is a, some kind of the sweet spot between how much we can push the DAX-based uh, enhancements to the visualization. And there are some things that we just don't like in terms of the time constraints and time consumption standpoint we don't want to use as a multi-tier charts, for example, that can take a lot of hours no matter, I, I wouldn't recommend to use that kind of things. But there are some specific DAX based approaches that are quite relatively easy to copy and paste to the different report pages just by replacing the main measures. So if mm -hmm. you will stick with such relatively simplified um, DAX, which enables us to copy and paste, then it's perfectly fine to use that in a very strategic um, circumstances. Yeah, more or less like DAX templates uh, uh, that um, 
Excuse, SQL BI is having on DAX patterns. Yeah. Another one from uh, Fernando. Uh, could be a good idea to split revenue versus profit to try to maximize the Y axis for each indicator. And I think this was uh, regarding the um, scaling of the um, chart. Would be a good idea to split revenue versus profit to try to maximize. I'm not sure if I understand correctly if your idea is to use just a two different charts and to display revenue and profit as a separate charts. Uh, not sure, Fernando, maybe you can come with uh, additional uh, clarifications. Yes, he said yes in the chat. It all depends from my perspective. There will be <laughs> some circumstances that it's uh, valid to show revenues and profit on different charts without unified scale. But if our intention is to see the scale of how the revenues are scaled to our um, profits, what was the, the relation in, in our business on how the revenues, uh, what is the scale actually the, from the revenues to the, to the gross profit, then it's relatively important to use the scale, the y-axis. So in general speaking, we try to synchronize y-axis scale as much as often as possible. Unless the profit is uh, so marginal comparing to the revenues and it's on such level that the monthly fluctuations uh, were, are not visible enough to get some additional insights, then it might be valid to unscale those charts to see the fluctuations, to highlight on the fluctuations for the profit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh... I just modified the setting so whenever we need clarification, uh, people can unmute and clarify. We had another question from uh, Christy. What are the scenarios in which uh, you would recommend the unified axis versus the individual one? Generally speaking, again. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if one metric is so high comparing to the other one that the other one is so low that it's like the flat line or the flat column and it not enable us to get any additional information that in terms of the fluctuation as i said previously then it's vital to use separate charts with unscaled information maybe to leave the just the y-axis scale to see that the, the scales are different. Maybe a text box is not necessary. Sometimes it might be valid to add a description for the end user, but it's optional. But in that case, when one metric is completely um, invisible because of the other one, then it's a good uh, a good moment to use unscaled y-axis. Mm -hmm. OK, the next one uh, from Nikos. How do we strike a balance between using numerous health measures to achieve a great visual versus having to maintain all the measures forever? In most of my uh, scenarios, reports are constant, constantly changing and evolving, so I would have to keep adding new logic into a multitude of health measures. So it's uh, it's about the sweet spot that uh, you were talking about uh, earlier. So it all depends on uh, how big the uh, uh, report is, uh, how complex and how often is changing, right? Exactly. There is a cost for the maintenance, etc. It's also the case of the requirements of the uh, end users. So one of them might uh, want to achieve cleaner report look and are willing to make uh, more sacrifices in terms of the time consumption from the BI developer standpoint, but the older one would like to see the very basic report style with insightful information, but in, not in a such clean from the design standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's also a lot of things uh, when we have to consider from the standpoint of our end users mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the requirements. Thank you. Another one from uh, Elena. Uh, she was asking about uh, if we could have the BBIX file. Unfortunately, in many cases, it won't be available because some of them are our, for example, companies demo or such kind of demos, which are available in terms of the interactive published web, 
but not all the PBX, the PBX, uh, the, the reports I show are available. Some of them are that I can present the information where they can be uh, available. However, for example, the dark dim is the, the company demo, which I wanted to present you in because of the extended amount of different functionalities, but that one it's unfortunately not available. OK, thank you. Uh, Fernando was asking the DSO, DSO chart could use a target to help understand context of the indicator. Uh, it was during uh, one of your slides. To be honest, I don't remember which is the DSO chart. Uh, there was a few of them actually. Uh, one of them was uh, using the target line for yeah. like the so it was using and the question is what is the purpose of using or whether it should not be used the target? Yeah, when should we use it or uh, when should we not use it? Uh, there was one with the uh, target. Uh, I remember top left uh, in one of the one of the sites. So it's uh, it depends on uh, the context you want to to give, right? Exactly. And sometimes, for example, the the target might be quite fixed. So we have like the strategic one value, which is quite static across different um, periods. So it might be valid to use uh, like the flat constant line. But if the target, on the other hand, fluctuates a lot with diff with um, each month, it's not so valid to use like the fixed line with fixed value. In that case, we would rather use the additional either stepped line or standard line to show the benchmarks if mm -hmm. that fluctuates over time for example every month so it depends whether the target is as a fixed value fixed. or it's fluctuated yeah well, Nikos if there is time I would love to hear the reasoning for the naming convention used in the measure names and I was asking additional questions and uh, it was not about the zebra BA actual gland and so on but about the naming conventions that you are using. Mm -hmm. Understand. I think it's not so important to describe it. I have a lot of different reports. Some of them are relatively new. Some of them are produced some time ago, and I not necess not, do not necessarily um, come back to all the reports that might have different naming conventions, which are constantly um, are changeable and fluctuate a lot. So sometimes I also use like the zero one or the alphabetic um, information to uh, order them in an appropriate way. But on the other hand, I'm not so sure about the um, specific naming convention. It's not something that has to be replicated mm -hmm. in all reports specifically. Yeah. Another question from Victor. What do you think about the OKVs visuals? Unfortunately, never used them before, so can't say nothing about it. I suppose that they might be very beneficial, and I think there are a lot of good, different, good, different customization, but never tried Ogmis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last one, uh, do you use and enable the built-in Power BI filter pane at all, instead of manually creating the left-hand side navigation? So it's uh, this one. All uh, right, I understand. Uh, never used that so far. So even this is I, the last one. Mm -hmm. Even if I consider that might be some scenarios that the filter pane will be beneficial. In most cases, I only I always use the standard filters because from my perspective, for the end users who might want to make some changes to the report using the uh, filters, it's still a bit more convenient to use them as a standard native slicers in the form of the drop down list or list or tails or whatever, comparing to using the um, built Power BI built uh, filter pane on the right side, which might also interfere with some additional our strategic filters that are um, invisible for our end users because it's not so uncommon that we use on a either on a um, level of the visualization uh, of a single visualization on, on a report page 
specific filters that we know from the perspective of the uh, developer that it should be included, but not necessarily should be also included in a filter pane. There might be also the features like hiding specific ones and uh, and locking. So it's actually it might be not the case, but in most cases, in very majority of cases, I only use the filter in a standard way comparing to the, the other one. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great session and uh, everybody loved it. We only have uh, two more minutes to go through the raffle and let me go and then we can wrap up because uh, people are having other meetings or uh, sure. dinner plans or uh, whatever. Let me share my screen again for the raffle and see how many participants do we have. Uh, for the raffle, of course, uh, I'm using a Power BI report. Uh, actually, we had a form, a Microsoft form and uh, Power Automate to get the data from the form and put them in a SharePoint list. And from there, uh, I'm gathering the data in a Power BI report. As you can see, uh, we are a pretty international uh, audience tonight. So yeah, most of us are from Romania, but we also have from Canada, US, Mexico, uh, Brazil, Philippines, uh, Ghana, and so on. Let's see if this is the last number of participants, the 21 participants. Let's refresh the Power BI report. 22 in the end. OK. Of course, I'm using Power Query to get the names and get only the name, the raffle ID, and the country. 22, refresh the preview, copy everything. Copy and use this really cool tool online, Wheel of Names. So I will just paste, paste the names here, delete it, shuffle the names, and drum roll, please. Let's get the first winner of the Enterprise DNA. Diana, congrats. You are the first winner. Great, thank you. No problem. Let's shuffle the names again and see the second and the last winner of the night. Fernando, congrats. You are the second winner. I will contact you both uh, to confirm your uh, email addresses and um, I'll tell you how to, to get into um, uh, Enterprise DNA uh, platform. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Gustav, for taking the time and uh, teaching us. I'll be uh, waiting for the presentation so I can upload it together with the uh, recording, most probably during the weekend. If I can do it earlier, it would be fine. Uh, anyway, it was a great, great session. I loved it very much. And uh, considering the turnout, I think everybody uh, loved it. Whoever couldn't join will be able to see it. So thank you and uh, see you all in um, our next meetup. And Gustav, you are always welcome to, to come to Ropag. Thank you if very you much. Really appreciate additional. Well, I will stop the recording now and whoever wants to stay for more, more than welcome. Bye, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Bye.